Hi there. I'm Dr. Christian Lehman. Currently, I'm based in Cleveland, and I'm going to be your Bard Sequence Summer Online Instructor. I'm on the same Eastern time zone as you are, and so don't worry about emailing me when you need to get in touch. I just wanted to send out this quick introductory email to introduce some of the course goals, introduce you to myself, and give a little flavor of what you might expect. My PhD is in classics, which is the study of Greek and Roman antiquity. Its name is highly problematic, and when we cover some of that material, I'll be sure to bring that up in class. My personal expertise is in the Roman poet Ovid and issues of exile and poetics, all of which will come to the fore, but I have many other interests and teaching experience as well. Let's start, though, by taking a quick look at the syllabus. So here's the introduction to the Bard sequence. A key philosophy of the Bard kind of pedagogical model is this idea of writing and thinking, that people can discover things about themselves and the world around them and the works they're reading if they respond to it in a series of prompts. And you're going to find yourself being asked to produce quite a bit of written work, whether it's varied from quick notes and annotations to a sustained project by the end. The importance is to constantly think about yourself as an author, which means that you're an authority. But rather than just talk about this, let me give you an example of what it might be like to be in class with me. Here, we have a poem by a poet that we're going to spend quite a bit of time with, uh, starting in two weeks named Sappho. She's born on Lesbos, which is an island in the Mediterranean. And here she's expressing her experience of Eros, the Greek god of love. Eros, et hinaxe moi frenas, hos animos, kaut oros druxen empetom. Eros, she begins, invoking the god of love. Eros did an action and shook my mind like a mountain wind falling on oak trees. With a poem this short, it's exactly acceptable and encouraged to press it as much as you can. So what is the action that Eros does? Eros shakes. The Greek verb, etnaxe, from tenaso, is to shake something, but also it's used frequently in the military to brandish a spear. And so there's almost an, ag there's an aggressive militaristic quality here with Eros shaking her mind, the phrenos. The phrenos we'll discuss is this deep center of your core that also kind of controls thought and instinct and mind, right? So the brain's not really located where we might think of it. What's it do? Eros shook my mind and we get a simile. We're gonna spend lots and lots of time breaking down similes. I know you guys have probably been thinking about similes since you were very, very young, but we'll be hopefully doing more interesting things with them than you have in the past and really think about how they shift our cognition of the world. So Eros shook my mind like a mountain wind falling on oak trees. So let's think about this image, right? This shift from personified God, Eros, to the individual woman's mind, to then an experience in nature, a mountain wind falling on oak trees, falling very interesting, right? Because it lacks a certain um, focus and direction. It's almost accidental. And it lacks the kind of force behind something like shaking. And so already we see our two verbs aren't exactly lining up. But she's also saying it's very, very specific, right? It's in the mountains. So it's separated from society it's in the cosmopole. And it's in the, it's, there's oak trees. Um, and oak trees you might think of as like tall and straight, but also they are signs of prophecy. They're in, in oak groves, there was a practice where um, Greek um, pro, uh, seers would go and they'd listen to the wind passing through the trees in order to answer suppliants questions that they might have. So now we're entering this whole other realm of perhaps this idea of Eros is connected with divination, which is connected to a divine quality of your love. And 
The other issue I want to talk about here is a word that I'm going to use so often, and we're going to challenge it um, and work through it and deal with um, different ramifications. But it's a word you probably use every day, and that's power. When we start this poem, it seems like Eros has the power because Eros is performing the verb and doing the shaking of her mind. Sappho then is made a victim of this power. There's almost no agency with the mountain wind falling on the oak trees, but with that moment of creating the simile, I want to suggest power shifts. Eros no longer has the power because Sappho is a poet and Sappho has written about the experience and is processing the experience. So that's already two levels of power. We started with Eros having the power, now the poet has the power. Well, I have power because I'm giving you this poem to look at. And now you have the power. And that's the necromantic quality of literature. You have, just, you have the power to resurrect this poem whenever you want, the power to share it to other people, the power to forget it. Ultimately, this course is going to be about thinking of power in all of these different ways, external sources, choice, uh, authorities, and interpretation, and many other ways in which we'll work through this. So that's just an example of some of the flavor of my personal pedagogical style. So here, if you turn, this is the syllabus that we'll now be discussing for a few minutes. So the core of the quest, the core question that we're gonna be working with is who are we, where do we come from? Already, we have a problem with this word of we. For our purposes, it'll be the people involved in this seminar, but I want you to constantly press against who's included with a we definition. It's not always going to be me, the instructor, and you, the students. It might be me as a white, cisgendered male that uses he, him pronouns, and you with all of your varied experience and identities. And so really think about pronouns and how they're used to both include and exclude. And so this is the question that the text we're about to read in Bard Seminar Sequence seek to address. What does it mean to be human? What connects us with the people who preceded us? How might we discover and learn from our reflection in the past? And one of the really important things to emphasize here in this paragraph is there's not one right answer and it can constantly shift. The other thing that I really wanna emphasize is the question does say what connects us, but it's okay to be disconnected. Not every text is asking for your empathy, is asking for you to connect with it. Sometimes a text is deliberately trying to antagonize you and that's okay. If you're struggling with a text, accept that. Be like, hey, I am struggling. This is not connecting to me. And that's an okay thing, as long as you work at figuring out why you're not connecting, right? The major thing I wanna discourage you from doing is saying, oh, I quit, or this isn't for me. Think through why you think it's not for you, right? Learn something about yourself by writing, preferably reading and thinking. The literature we will use to address such questions comes largely from a tradition referred to as the Western canon. And for most of history, it has been revered as the core of what are called great books. And yet we must ask the question, what makes these books great? And can they really be great if they depend predominantly on the perspectives of dead, privileged, European, heterosexual, cisgender, white men? In a lot of ways, you guys are very, very lucky to be having this seminar at this time. This question here and this um, provocation in the second paragraph has gone unquestioned and unprovoked in, in the academy for generations since almost the inception of the academy and it's only a recent turn that we're starting to really pressure it and it's been a joy to be part of teaching while this takes part to be part of the movement in fact challenging these voices pay attention to those quotation marks around western canon because i'm going to talk about that briefly in the next slide and then the last the last paragraph here thus we will not just read these texts but draw them into conversation with those written by authors and philosophers from outside of this sphere of privilege writers who question expand and even explode the ideas of these great thinkers. Um, this is pretty genially written, right? As though it's like a conversation, but we're going to find a lot of aggression. Um, and it's really gonna be a joy to experience, a moment of discomfort to experience, and something that may make us re-question some of our assumptions. Ideally, we're going to have to rethink and reread a lot of the material that we work with. So a quick note on the idea of the Western canon and Western civilization. Um, you may hear me slip and use these phrases. 
if I ever do and I don't gesture it with quotation marks in the air, do note it and call it out. Because I never want to be somebody that perpetuates this constant myth. Because at the root of the idea of Western canon and Western civilization is a question of west of what? If you're thinking west of Europe or west of Britain, then you should be including all of the Caribbean, all of South America, but the, all of Central America, but these aren't included in that conversation. It's a false genealogy when you talk about Western civilization, uh, with, complete with a myth of improvement and frontierism. Oh, we're always expanding as we go westward um, because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west or some sort of flim flam. And that comes from there. Um, it's by definition an exclusionary model. It says that only a certain direction and movement of thought is privileged, which we will constantly be challenging. Uh, and the whole phrase and project is rooted in colonialism, genocide, erasure, and deliberate perpetuation of ignorance and white supremacy. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on all of this because these are definitely going to be issues that we raise as we go. You'll notice the GIF, it comes from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is something you will probably be hearing me talk a lot about, and just the casual references. So back to the syllabus. Some quick questions that we had. How do we understand what it means to be human from different perspectives and starting points? Something that will challenge is the idea that there's one notion of being human, right? We're not gonna be pursuing great virtues and monolithic abstractions. Different people have different definitions of human and humanity at different times, and it changes. What we'll really be working with is how can we think about our own humanity? How do power and privilege shape our understanding of ourselves? Power especially is the word that we'll be using to govern a lot of our thinking. What commonalities can we see across different historical and cultural moments? And how might we recognize, account for, and respond to our differences? And again, this is not monolithic differences between us and them, because within them, there's gonna be a lot of differences that you might, some you might agree with and some you don't. Right? We're gonna really press against creating artificial categories of people, whether it's ourselves or others, and stick to as specific as possible, as possible engagement with specific authors and texts, because even within the same uh, corpus, the same body of work an author might create, there's going to be disagreement with themselves. Throughout the sequence program, we will not just recognize and analyze these conversations, but we will enter into them, adding our voices to the many great, there's that word again, writers who have taken on such questions. This is where you put yourself in that conversation by your own power of writing, right? Think about Sappho taking control of that erotic moment with the use of the pen. Well, in that case, it's going to be papyrus, but such is the case of metaphor. And yours may well just be on keyboard or on sticky notes, uh, whatever it happens to be. It's about writing down something so you can confront it again later on. And we will do so in several important ways, participating in a dynamic discussion with our peers, reading extensively and thoroughly, and writing about and annotating what we read and discuss in multiple different forms and contexts. So this helps get us to the course syllabus. Weeks one and two are going to cover rights and resistance, weeks three and four, eros, week four and five, explorations and encounters. You'll see that um, there's some overlap there in that fourth week that you can look forward to as we start to really put a lot of voices into a cacophony of ideas. And then after the course is over, you'll have a lot of time to think and reflect as you produce your final piece of polished writing. And then meet with me in a kind of final recitation exam where we discuss the entire ideas of the course and where your thinking might have begun and where it is at the end. Let's break this down just a little bit briefly. What you can look forward to in the first two weeks with rights and resistance are two major core texts. James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time and Sophocles and Dory's Antigone and Ferguson. This week, and you, most of you already read the first part of The Fire Next Time, will be Baldwin and Kendrick that we're going to kind of put in conversation with each other. You can expect other videos where I help lay down some groundwork about these texts, but really I will just usually give one or two ideas that I, I'm thinking about in order to make sure there's as much space as possible for your voice and your perspectives. The following week, next week, we'll be doing Sophocles and Dory. The reason there's two authors there is Dory's is the translator of Sophocles' ancient Greek play, Antigone, and he takes it and he sets it in Ferguson. So we'll be thinking a lot about what it means to, what's the act of reception? How do you add or apply or manipulate an ancient myth or text to your current situation? 
And there also we'll be reading contemporary poetry. The following weeks, we're going to shift into Eros, this idea of the erotic desire sexuality, as we work through the core texts of Sappho's If Not Winter, which is a collection of poetry. You already have experience with one Sappho poem with me. Um, Plato's Symposium, which we'll use extensively, and Jenkins's film Moonlight. In this, we'll also have a variety of essays and songs again with Nicki Minaj. And then our final unit, Explorations and Encounters, will be the Odyssey with Emily Wilson's really phenomenal translation from last year, paired with Derek Walcott's Homeros, which is an Afro-Caribbean epic poem that builds heavily on knowledge of the Odyssey and the Iliad and the ancient kind of like tradition that came out of Greek uh, literature, but it's doing its own thing. So we're gonna try to give space and voice to that. We'll also be working through a variety of other perspectives on thinking through Homeric material by contemporary poets. One thing that we'll be doing in that unit, because you, many of you have probably uh, read the Odyssey before, we're going to be flipping the script in a lot of ways and really viewing Odysseus as kind of a colonial figure, a really dangerous figure, one who has been heroized for the wrong reasons and for kind of destruction of um, civilized, other civilizations and genocide. Um, it should be a really interesting and exciting period of time for us. So what can you expect this online seminar to look like? Well, you're gonna, we're gonna be creating a community in which we'll all be engaged. There's going to be frequent and sustained reading and especially rereading. Thus, for instance, thus, for instance, what a terrible phrasing. I will offer you, uh, or I'll give you the text that we'll all be discussing and annotating. And then I'll give a short video like this one in which I will point to a certain set of passages that I'll ask you to kind of reread and re-engage with. And then when we go into our online discussions, which we'll have two of per week as a full class, I'll try to focus on some of those in the beginning part of class. And then in the second part of class, we'll open things up to what you guys have discovered and put you all in conversation with each other and your own personal examples and kind of trace how you're changing intellectually as we move through the course. Um, most fundamentally though, we will be writing and thinking. There's going to be frequent um, times where I'll offer a prompt or somebody will say something in class that I think is really good to think through. And so I'll ask us to all stop for two to five minutes and we'll just um, write on our own. Um, and so there's gonna be some synchronous meeting and participation as well. Like those are the two classes a week that you can look forward to in addition to annotating on perusal and engaging with materials in other ways. So because some of you might be concerned about how the grading is going to work, the weekly assignments for those first four or five weeks are going to be based largely on a check, check plus and check minus system. And so that includes uh, making your free writes, your discussion responses, writing challenges. These are all things I'm going to explain. Participation in discussion and annotation. Uh, and then a core component of your grade is going to come from extensive written and oral arguments that will happen after the course has ended and you'll have plenty of time to prepare for both of those. So what's a free write? A free write, or is also called a focused free write, are timed writing requests where I'll give a prompt and ask you to write for two to five minutes. And the point here is you need to generate kind of as much as you can. You're not proofreading anything, you're writing your ideas into action. You're making self-discovery. So you're not crossing anything out. You just keep going forward in order to um, work with yourself, by yourself, and with just an idea. It's a really exciting process that if you give into it, can generate an enormous amount of materials and help you realize who you are as your own thinker. That will also include an element of sharing either whole free rights or words and phrases. Discussion responses. These are original responses that should indicate that you have thought it through a question or a prompt and are clearly engaged with and responding to the text. So these are going to, um, free rights will be more abstract. Um, a discussion question is going to be really rooted in a phrase or a paragraph in a text. Um, conversation responses, which are responses that you give to your peers, should indicate that you're engaging with their um, writing and you're either politely challenging them or generously building on their idea. And this is part of that building up of a community that we're doing, right? It's not just you in conversation with a single author, it's the members of this class in conversation with each other, and that will include me. Finally, 
at the end of each week, there's going to be a writing challenge. And this is going to ask you to produce a polished piece of short writing, usually about one page, that shows evidence of thinking about your own presentation of material and fulfills the prompt. Right? This is where you have a chance to kind of craft writing. So if a discussion question is, or a free write is just about writing as much as possible, no craft, and um, <clears throat> activating your mind, a discussion question is kind of focusing you in on a conversation that you're having with the text or with a peer, but a writing challenge is about working and reworking your own prose in order for you to best express the idea that you have. The participation in the discussion will come largely um, during the group meetings and the small check-ins that will happen synchronously um, online. In this case, participation will be about like referring to the ideas of your classmates and actively joining in the shared knowledge growth of the seminar, right? Like, not just sitting passively by, but using the raised hand or um, adding to the chat window, um, talking to other people, uh, offering a different opinion, pointing us to another part in the text, right? Just being present. Uh, in no way is this going to be based on, like, if you have your head up or down, you can even keep your screen dark. I don't, I'm, you will not be judged on eye contact in any way. This is not a panopticon of digital technology. Um, annotation. In many ways, this is going to be one of the most important things that you do. Um, this is about highlighting and adding questions to the perusal document, making comments, making connections to larger ideas. And what this shows is active reading, maybe like returning to an idea, pointing back and forth to different parts of the text and how it communicates with itself, um, making personal connections to the material and course ideas. Right? So it's moving beyond simply making a check or a highlight and asking yourself why you did that. It's completely appropriate to make checks and highlights because they draw your attention back to something. What an annotation though asks you to do is think through why your instinct told you to mark that. And so our first assignment, which many of you have already done, is a short annotation assignment for Baldwin's My Dungeon Shook, the first part of The Fire Next Time. And then in here, what I really want you to think about is the text is your intellectual playground. playground. You can excavate, create in it, fall in it, get dirty, get bloody, get angry, laugh, discover, be yourself, change yourself, and just be part of binding a community together. Start talking to each other. With that, you can expect um, kind of a weekly email every maybe Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon evening, in which I'll lay out that current course week's goals and deadlines, and two videos a week kind of discussing some of our major ideas. So I look forward to engaging with you all, meeting you, changing, um, just changing all of our lives. And so I'll see you all on Monday.